continue our study on the subject of love from last week. And uh, so if you would turn in your Bibles this morning or today, morning has gone. All right. Uh, we're going to look at John chapter 15 and we'll go to verse 12. John chapter 15, verse 12. And I'll give you a, a couple of verses that we looked at, but I want to just review and then launch from there. So we're going to look at John 15, verse 12, first of all. Verse 12 in the uh, uh, New King James Version says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. So the first part, of course, that you love one another. Second part, do it like I love you. Now, that's a pretty big commandment, isn't it? And so we're to love one another as Jesus has loved us in the same way, same manner that Jesus has loved us. We are to love other people. Now, if you go with me to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22, we're going to go to verse 35, Matthew 22 and verse 35. In verse 35, it says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, this lawyer was a lawyer that had to do with God's law. And so, this person says, it was, he was testing him. And uh, he said, Which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus responded to him and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So that Jesus then would be stating that this is the greatest commandment, uh, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then Mark chapter 12, uh, another verse similar, says, and with all your strength. Jesus is actually quoting the Bible. You know, Jesus was a man of the word, wasn't he? And so he's quoting the Bible. And if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Well, if you consider that, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Then your heart is is a part of you. We looked some last week and just gave you some uh, indication <coughs> from the Word that you have the ability to do what God has commanded you to do, and that is to love as He loved us, right? And that would be to love other people as He loved us, but we also then, of course, are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but to love people is uh, maybe some, somewhat more challenging than it is to love God because uh, if you have a clear perception of God, of course, you know, because a lot of people, they are offended at God because they think God did something wrong. God did something against them, and somehow they blame Him. And, uh, but to love people, uh, God has given us a commandment. And he says that we're to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and strength. Well, to love God with all your heart would have to do with your spirit, the part of you that is born again. That when you accept Jesus as the Lord of your life, your spirit man, your inner man, the inner part of you, is literally born again. When you're born again, that spirit part of you is born of God. There are a number of scriptures that say uh, whatever is born of God, for example, born of God, meaning that your life came from God, God being your father, you've been born of God, and if you're born of God, then you're born of love, because God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him, so if you're born of God, then God's love dwells in you. All right, so you have the ability to do what Jesus has commanded you to do, so it's one thing for God to give you a command, another thing for you to be able to do it, right? But God doesn't command us to do things that we cannot do or we don't have the capacity or the ability to do. So he's given us the command, but he's also given us the ability to obey the command. 
And so in this verse, you can love the Lord your God with all your heart. Your heart's been born again. You have God's love uh, in your heart. And you have uh, the nature of love on the inside of you. So you can certainly love God with your heart. Then he says, love the Lord with all your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So you can love the Lord with your mind, with your thoughts, and your attitude, your mind, your will. You can will to love God, right? You can choose. It's a choice. And everybody has to choose for themselves. No one can choose for you. Everybody has to choose to love God. So you can will to love God. And then, last of all, with your emotions, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So you can emotionally connect with God as well as spiritually. Now, if you spiritually connect with God, then it's going to affect your emotions. And so you, it has an emotional effect on your life. And so if you spiritually connect with God, it's going to affect your mind. It's going to affect your will. And so God wants you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, will, and your emotions, and with all your strength, which would uh, predominantly uh, have to do with your body. So your spirit, soul, and body, you are to love God. Give your whole to him. That would in, involve your whole person, your whole being. And uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 23 says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body would be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you are to love God with your spirit, soul, and body. But then he goes on to say after that in verse 38, this is the first and great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your uh, mind, your strength. And he said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor, how? As yourself. Love your neighbor neighbor as yourself. Now, that's a, a big command as well, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but love your neighbor as yourself. And as I said, it could be more challenging sometimes to love your neighbor than to love God. And so both could be hindered by your thinking. Couldn't it? I've, I've met people, talked to people, and somehow they have assigned to God the bad things that have happened to them. And so they have blamed God. And that's an unfortunate, isn't it? But why is that? Perhaps somebody said something to them, they bought into it. Uh, maybe even some religious thinking, they bought into it. And they uh, blamed God for the bad things that have happened to their life. Well, God's not in control of everything that happens in the world. He's not in control and making bad things happen to people. No, we live in a world of sin. Sin came into the world by one man, Adam, death by sin, death passed upon all men for all that all of sin. In other words, sin came into the world by man's choice. And it brought all kinds of evil in this world. And the devil became the god of this world. So the devil is working in this world that we live in. So all the bad things that happen are not God doing it. There's an evil presence and power in this world. The devil, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. And so a person sinking could hinder them from loving God. Their false perception of who God is and God's nature and how much he loved them or doesn't love them, <laughs> right? So if they had a wrong perception of God, they would not be able to effectively do that with their whole heart, soul, mind, strength. Same is true of our perception of people. Sometimes our perception of people hinders us from loving people. But of course, if we let the natural rule us, then we're not walking in the Spirit. Paul said, walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is bitterness and anger and all kinds of uh, negative emotion, right? And to walk in the spirit, you're going to have love, joy, and peace, and patience, and goodness, and kindness, and meekness, and temperance, and faith, and that's the fruit of the spirit. So uh, the devil tries to get us or lure, lure us to be in the flesh or to walk in the flesh. So the Holy Spirit is always prompting us 
and I will say prompt us, he prompts us, he leads us, he guides us, he doesn't make us. If he made every Christian walk in the Spirit, every Christian would be walking in the Spirit. If he made every Christian walk in love, then every Christian would be walking in love. But he doesn't make us. He gives us the ability to choose and to do. So love would be a choice that we have to choose to do. And that is in obedience to God's command. So here, in this case, he says, now you're to love God with all your heart, your soul, mind, and strength. But now you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, truthfully, most people think they're doing good, doing pretty good. Right? I mean, be honest. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. All right. At, at the love thing, you know. They're doing their part. Uh, but it's easy to shift the responsibility to someone else that it's really their fault. Well, we all have to take personal responsibility, and Jesus didn't say, love your neighbor as yourself if they are loving you. May I say that again? Jesus didn't say, love your, love your neighbor as yourself if they're loving you. He just simply said, straight, simple, love your neighbor as yourself. So that is his command. And so that's what we are called to do. Now, in order to do that, obviously we have to have the love of God on the inside in order to do it effectively. And so God's given us that love and enabled us to do so. Verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The whole law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the law and prophets are dependent upon This, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's like key to the whole thing. It's key to Christianity as well. It's key to holding up the law and the prophets, but it's key to your Christian life and experience. Now, we're going to go to the uh, New Testament here in the book of Romans. And we're going to go to Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, and we're going to begin with verse 7. It says, verse 7, render therefore to all their due. Render to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes. You know, I thought it an appropriate time to talk about taxes. I just happened to be teaching out of this passage. Uh, So, render to whom taxes are due. Well, you have to... Uh, pay taxes to the IRS, to our government, and we have, thankfully, benefits from that. You have roads to drive on, right? You have uh, other uh, things that are a blessing to us to be able to utilize and enjoy. Uh, I won't get into that any further. There are other things we wish they didn't do, but anyway, customs to whom customs, all right, so custom to whom custom is due. There are different types of customs. People have different customs, different cultures. And so we're to honor one another and be considerate of other people's customs, even though that's not your own, right? He says, fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Honor to whom honor. Giving honor to whom honor is due. Well, if you read the verses before, in verses 1 through uh, 6 here, you see that (laughs) <laughs> that God is talking to us, the church, about authority. I mean, he's talking about natural authority, not just spiritual authority. And he's talking to us about, and then he takes it to this verse and say, give honor to whom honor is due. So in other words, we are to give honor to our president because of an office that he stands in. And so we are to give honor to those who sit in seats of authority in Washington, D.C. It didn't actually say if you agree with them. It just says that you're to give honor to them because of the office. We're to give honor to our uh, national government, our federal government. We're to give honor to our state government, government, our governor. 
whether you agree or voted for them or not. Didn't even involve that. Didn't even ask if you voted or not. No, it simply says give honor to those whom honor is due. So there's a certain element of honor that you give to those who are in a position of authority. Across the board, you just do it. Now, obviously you can give greater honor if they're a person of their word, a person of character. They follow through on what they said that they would do. Things, so forth. <laughs> if they're a person of character, it'd be easy to give honor to them, right? But at a certain level of honor just because of the office that they stand in. And locally, you know, our mayor of our city, give honor to the authority that she has. Give honor to the authority of our uh, uh, policeman. I mean, you know, if the policeman pulls up behind you and has his lights on, her lights on, it's not just for a parade. You know, so, <laughs> you know, you don't get to say, well, you know, I just thought they wanted to escort me from behind. <laughs> yeah, I know. They want you to pull over. It's called honor. You honor their authority and you pull over. You respect who they are and the authority that they carry. And if they come up to your car, you don't say, well, you know, what are you doing pulling me over? Well, you no, know, if you start that, you might be going to jail. I don't know. It depends on how far you take it. Now, in other words, you give them honor for the office that they stand in. So... You give honor to civil authority. You give uh, honor to spiritual authority uh, in the church, pastors, and others that are in uh, spiritual authority. Well, then you give honor to domestic authority at home. You give, uh, the scriptures teach us, uh, to give honor to your father and mother. It said if you do so, uh, that it'll uh, be well with you. You'll live long on the earth. That's a pretty good promise, don't you think? Be well with you. Live a long life. I mean... While you're living, and you're, you're doing well while you're living, and you're living long. That's great. It's a blessing. All right, then, of course, husbands are to honor their wives. Wives are to honor their husbands. In the home, domestic authority, honor, giving honor. Siblings should honor one another. All right, so then, of course, let's take it beyond that. We all should give honor and respect to other people. He said custom to whom custom. They may be different. They may have different uh, even beliefs. But you still give honor to people. You respect people. Well, let's go further here. Verse uh, 8, he says, Owe no man anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. You know, owe no one anything except to love one another. In other words, your indebtedness, what does indebtedness owe uh, imply? It implies responsibility, doesn't it? I mean, it'd be nice if uh, somebody would come along and just pay off all our debt as individuals. Wouldn't that be nice? How many would welcome that if somebody came along and said, I want to pay off all your debt? I'd like for somebody to just pay off the national debt. That would be a blessing. <laughs> That would release our economy, you know, if you hadn't, didn't have a national debt like we do. All right, so that would be nice, but debt is a personal responsibility if it's yours. If you created it, it's yours. Well, in this case, he said, oh, no man, anything but to what? Love them. So we do, according to this verse, owe everyone love. He said, oh, no man, anything but to love him. And then the latter part says, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. The person that loves someone has fulfilled the law. Well, we just read that on these two commandments uh, hang the whole law and the prophets, didn't we? Well, let's go to the next verse, verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. In other words, now he's going to give you the commandments, Ten Commandments. He's not going to give you all of them, but he's going to list a few. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all, they are all summed up in this saying, namely, 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he says that basically all the Ten Commandments are really about your relationship with people. What? You shall not commit adultery. I mean, you're not going to commit adultery on your wife or your husband because you love them. Or you're not going to uh, murder somebody because you love them. Or you're not going to steal from somebody. Why? Because you love them. Or you don't want someone to do that to you, so you don't want to do that to them. Love wouldn't do it to someone else. Love doesn't want it done to it. In other words, we don't want it done to us. All right, so you shall not covet. Covet, basically, basically you want what they have. You not covet their goods. You shouldn't covet their spouse or their wife or husband. Right? Thou shalt not covet. If there's any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, some have suggested and actually said that we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Please, that's a foolish statement. Now, I understand what they try to say, but it's really not a scriptural basis. You do still have to keep the Ten Commandments. You just do it motivated by love. Now, the Ten Commandments are basically the basis of our law in the United States. It's the basis of law. And that's why Moses is on the Supreme Court. Mo- in fact, carved in stone. You know? So there are people in our culture, in our world today, that would like to push God out of government and push God out of any place in the public arena. In fact, they'd like to push God out, period. But they would like for us to just stay in our church all by ourselves and not affect the culture so that they can have their way and get everything the way they want it to be, and it would be godless. All right, so there's a push and a move of that in all different arenas of life today in our culture. Push God out of government. Separation of church and state. So we got to push God out of government. We got to push God out of the public arena. We've got to push God out of the out of actually corporations. You can talk about anything else but God. And you can talk about God a little bit, just don't talk about Jesus. Because really you're crossing the line when you talk about Jesus. Because that's the confrontation point. Because there are many gods in their mind, but you have to. Stay off the one Jesus. Because there's only one Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. All right, so, but there is only one true and living God as well. But see, uh, so the move is to push God out of the arena of life. But you can't push God out of life because God's in you. And if God's in you, then God wants to affect the culture that you live in. So he wants us to love people on every level. <coughs> so anyone could be referred to as your neighbor. Love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. In this case, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to treat them with the same regard you'd like to be treated. Because you love yourself, you value yourself, and you also love them, and you value them. Now, then the next verse says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, really, you're keeping the commandments. You're just doing it motivated by love. You don't eliminate the commands. The commands are there. They don't go away. You say, well, we're not under the law. You're under grace. Absolutely. You're under the grace of God, and the grace of God enables you to keep the word of God, the commands of God. So to say you don't have to keep the commandments would be like saying um, you can go murder somebody if you'd like. Right? No, you can't do that. You can't do it legally and hopefully get by with it. Right? You can't just go, well, I don't have to keep the law and go steal something. You might could covet and nobody know you're doing it. 
You know, you might not go to uh, jail for it, but if you steal, you might go to jail. Or if you murder somebody, you, hopefully they catch you and, and you go to jail. And we won't go any further with that. Could go further, but we'll just, just state the case, right? So God wants us to abide by the commandments, but you're doing it motivated by love. Now li- listen to it in the Johnson translation. It says, so love fulfills the intent of the rule because it wills positive good to the neighbor. Love fulfills the intent of the rule. In other words, God gave commandment to unregenerate people. He gave a command not to steal, not to kill, not, or not to murder. Actually, it's literally murder, not just kill. Because everyone has a right to self-defense. If somebody's trying to kill you or murder you, then you have a right to self-defense. You know, that's the way it is, and that's God's way. So God wants you to defend yourself. He wants a country to defend itself. Right. So as an individual, you have that right, but you never have the right not to love. Just because you kill them. Before they killed you, doesn't mean you didn't love them. It just means that you wanted to live. And they don't want you to live. And so, I'm going to defend myself. All right, so, enough said about that. Basically, love fulfills the intent of the rule. So, he gave a commandment to unregenerate people that he made a covenant with. And it was based on a covenant. And so he made covenant, and he said, now this is my commandments, and you have to keep them. And there was a great punishment if you didn't keep the commands. Well, we're under grace, and yet we still are to keep the commands, but we are to do it motivated by the love of God that is in us. So love fulfills the intent of the rule. That was the rule, but love fulfills the intent. This is the reason God gives it. It's for your protection and everyone else's protection. It's for your good and everyone else's good. That's what love does. Love is not just selfish, looking out for self and looking out for my own benefit. But love is looking out for everyone's good and everyone's benefit. Okay, so let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Matthew 7, 12 says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, what motivates that kind of attitude? He said, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. What motivates that kind of attitude, we call it the golden rule, is the love of God. You do to people what you would want them to do to you. You treat them the way you'd like them to treat you. Now, even people that really are not sane or good, you know, have a healthy mind and healthy life, they want people to treat them with love. You know, the core of a person's desire would be that they want people to respect them, to honor them, to love them, to care for them. Some reason life didn't treat them that way or something happened along the way and their pain caused them to react and they went crazy and and they are destructive to other people on different levels. And I'm not just talking about somebody that just shot, you know, people uh, in the workplace just this weekend. I'm talking about overall, that people on different levels do harm to other people. And so, in, in our lives, we realize that the love of God is in us, and we have the ability to love people and to do them good. And we should be motivated in that way and do the, treat them the way we would want to be treated. Now, that's not perfect, because not everyone has a good perception of, of how to even treat themselves. But it's pretty close. And love is motivated to do to others the way you would like them to do to you. So the golden rule was given by Jesus of Nazareth, who was used, uh, who used it to summarize the Torah. Do to others what you want them to do to you. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets. This is God's command, the way God wants us to live our lives. Verse 
Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 31 says, And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. So there is a law of sowing and reaping, and it works in every area of our lives. If we want a harvest of good done to us, we must sow good toward others. So if you'll do good to someone else, God will make sure somebody does good to you. But we can't always expect the harvest to come from the person you did good to. So you always have to look to God as your source of all things. And even the way you're treated. Because not everyone gives respect to those that respect them. And not everyone gives honor to those that honor them. And not everyone gives love to those that love them. Some people don't have that love of God in their heart, and some people don't choose to live out of the love that is in their heart, even though they have it. All right, so you can't always expect the, uh, the harvest or the return on your good deed or your action to come from the person you did it for or to. So if you do that, then you won't live disappointed. But your expectation is always on them. No, my expectation is on God. Not everyone, and they should, they should reciprocate, shouldn't they? That should be the right way for them to respond in a way that's doing good to you as well. And yet, you can't always expect it to come from that individual. And if you do, you will be disappointed. Amen. <coughs> so, we're going to just kind of bring this a little closer to the house. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So we talked about honor, you know. We talked about how we are to honor at different levels of authority. Well, then, of course, we're to honor everyone. We're to honor and respect people around us. In this particular uh, setting, we're going to look at it and how God views it at the house or at home. You know, actually, God started this thing with a family. He started with Adam and Eve. That was God's plan. He was going to create Adam and Eve. What did he say? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and fowl of the air and so forth. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, now I want you to procreate. I want you to have kids. That was God's plan. We know <laughs> that Adam messed that up. Eve messed that up, right? By their uh, wrong choice. They didn't just do bad to themselves. They did bad to everybody else. And we've all been affected. The whole human race has been affected by Adam's choice and Eve's choice and their decision to do what God had commanded them not to do. So very clearly, here God's given us commands not to kill, not to uh, steal, not to murder. You understand? Not, uh, you're, you're not to do these things, not to covet. But then he says, this is what you do. You love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Adam and Eve, <coughs> excuse me, messed it up in the beginning, and we've all suffered because of it. So, in order to change this course, we got to turn it around. You got to start at the house. So, it's not enough to just love people at church. You got to love your wife, love your husband, love your children, love your family. And it starts at home. So let's go here, and we'll just pick it up in verse 25. And it's all important, but we're just going to go to verse 25. Because it says, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So here Jesus said, I want you to love your wife as I love the church. Well, in, in John 15, we saw, he said, I want you to love one another as I've loved you. But that's everybody, right? So that would include everyone, love one another. But then love your neighbor as yourself. doesn't just mean your neighbor that lives next door to you. It means everybody, basically. And it could include anyone, people that you know, people that you don't know. And so the Good Samaritan didn't know. The man that was lying by the road, he didn't know him, but he took care of him. He did good, didn't he? That's why we call him the Good Samaritan. All right, so here, 
We've got this responsibility because we owe every man love, every person love. That's our responsibility. That's our uh, command from Jesus. And so he says, husbands, you have this responsibility at the house. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing, cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. So I personally believe that that's what Adam should have done. I believe Adam should have spoke the word to his wife. And let, instead of letting her just, because uh, the assumption is, I mean, based on the uh, scripture, that Adam was right there because she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then she gave also to her husband, and he did eat. Instead of him speaking up and saying something when she was being lied to by the devil, very clearly she was being lied to, what the devil said and what God said was different. And so she was being lied to and manipulated, and she bought into it and then gave also to her husband, and he also ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had already told him, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die the day you eat. Well, he had also said, you can eat of every tree of the garden, so every good tree is good for food and pleasant to the sight. It's good for you. It's going to bring blessing to you, but there's one tree you don't eat, right? Well, they did it. In disobedience, so you got a, 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 a wife that is yielding to the devil, and you've got a man that's passive about it, and he didn't say anything about it. He just let it happen, and then he just followed suit. He said, yes, ma'am. Well, anything else? He just followed her. It's unfortunate, isn't it? Man, you've been suffering all your life in some degree because of what Adam and, and Eve chose to do. So what we need to do is turn the culture around, turn things around. Now, this is a big, it's a big deal to change the culture because we've got a world that is broken when it comes to families. But we can't just say, well, let's just give up on the thing. It's like what people do, Christians even do. They just kind of see the culture just going to pot, going to hell, and they just say, well, that's the way it is. It's the world. That's just the way the world is. Well... That's not what we're called to do is just say, that's just the way the world is. No, how we're to change is start where we know to start and start at the house. Start with ourselves and start at home and do something at the house that's going to change our culture that then affects the culture and makes a difference in other families. And if your family was broken, God wants to fix your family, restore your family, but then he wants your kids to start and have a better life than you had. He wants it to be better for the future generations, and how's that going to happen unless we trust God to turn things around, and let's go back to the basics. And this is like bottom floor, foundation kind of stuff, love your neighbor as yourself, love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's foundational. All right, so he says that you are to wash her with the word. So Adam should have spoke the word. Husbands, this is your turn to say amen. You need to speak the word over your wife and to your wife. Speak the word. Because there's power in the word of God to cleanse, to sanctify, to separate you from the world and its uh, influence in your life. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, he, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So he's talking about the church and your relationship with your spouse as well. It's kind of going back and forth. So that he might present her to himself a glorious church. We the church, Jesus would present us to himself, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be holy and without blemish, so Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. The person that loves his wife loves himself. Isn't that what Jesus said do? Love your neighbor as yourself or love others as yourself or as I loved you. So both are true. We need to love as Christ loved us, but we need to love God in order to do that. 
Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love our neighbor as ourselves, and that would include our spouse. And how much more would it be to your wife or your husband, come on, to love them if God has commanded us to love everybody? Right? So he says here that if you love your wife, you love yourself. For no man ever yet hated his flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Nourishes and cherishes their own flesh. I mean, unless you're not healthy mentally, emotionally, you take care of yourself. Right? Unless the devil has really twisted a person's mind and messed them up in their thinking, they take care of their own body. They would protect themselves, right? Take care of themselves. Well, then he said, if you do that, if you take care of your wife, you love your wife, then you're actually loving yourself. Just as the Lord does the church, he values the church. He loves the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. There he goes again. Love his wife as himself. So if you're going to have a good relationship with your spouse, you're going to have to love yourself. A lot of times when you're dealing with people in in marriage relationships, uh, the problem is not always who they think it is. In other words, people think, well, my husband or my wife. In other words, they're thinking that the issue is with them. But many times it's with the person that thinks it's somebody else. I'm preaching better than you, amen. And I'm saying that many times it's with a person that thinks it's somebody else. So you have to face yourself. In other words, everybody has to look the mirror, look in the mirror for themselves. Now, Lord, how can I make the adjustment? I mean, over the years, you know, especially when we first got married, my wife and I, you know, we've been married for 36 years. But when we first got married, we had some challenges. I'm just telling you. We were totally different personalities. Totally on the other end of the spectrum. And so uh, we had some challenges. But even though we were having challenges and uh, we'd have disagreements, you can call them arguments, whatever you want to call them, but uh, we weren't happy with each other. And and in those uh, situations, even if I thought, you know, she's really wrong, even if I thought she's wrong, I would say, Holy Spirit, now, where am I wrong? Because I'm going to approach this because I want some reconciliation, and I would like some restoration here. So where am I wrong? It's pretty easy to see where other people are wrong because we see through that prism. It's It's just a nature of the flesh is that you see and you can easily critique or criticize someone else for their lack or what they don't do, or what they did do, or how they reacted, or how they said this, or what, you know, the list is long. So it's easy to do that, but you have to say, Holy Spirit, show me where I need to make adjustment. So that way, when I'm approaching for reconciliation, I can say, you know, I'm sorry. Now, the appropriate response is for them, if they're wrong, to then repent. (coughs) Now, we all know that not everybody's quick, right, at that. But we are to be slow to wrath, slow to anger. Amen. That's what the Scripture says. And slow to speak. But most people are quick to speak, quick to wrath, quick to anger, and so you got to curb that thing. If you don't curb it, it will control you. And it doesn't just control you. It controls your relationships. And so what you got to do is you got you to find a place of uh, personal conscience. Now, you say, well, I'm not even married. Well, do you have friends? Because it, it works the same way, basically. You, gotta, uh, you, you have a relationship. You're going to have to learn to deal with relationships because relationships are not going to go away. They may go away from you. (laughs) But they're not going to go away. This is the way life is. 
is dealing with people. It doesn't matter where you go. You got to deal with people. If you go home, you got to deal with family. You say, well, I'm going to leave the house because I'm going to go to the store. When you get there, there are people there. <laughs> well, I'm going to stay at work later because I got to go home and I got to deal with her or you deal with him. Deal with the kids, you know. But at work, you got to deal with them. And probably they got to deal with you because you don't want to go home because you're not happy at the house. You're not happy at the store. You're not happy at work. Are you with me? So relationships go wherever you go. I mean, you got to deal with people no matter what. So the key is dealing with them based on the Word of God, based on the love of God. And let's go to the next verse, verse 33. Again, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. Love his wife as himself. And the wife see that she respects her husband. The wife see that she respects her husband. Now, respect is loving someone the way they want to be loved. Or respect is being considerate of their desires and their wishes. What would make them feel the greatest love from you? I'm going to say it again. What would make them feel the greatest love from you? Well, that's what you want them to feel, isn't it? You want them to sense and feel that you love them and you care for them. So you are extending yourself. And you're sharing the love of God out of your heart. And what happens in most cases, not 100%, because some people are very selfish and unwilling to, to give back what they've received, but your greatest success story will be based on you loving people. Again, not everybody's going to reciprocate, and even sometimes in, in marriage relationships, the other party doesn't reciprocate, and eventually... Things dissolve because they're unwilling, just totally unwilling. And a lot of things occur when that's the case. So, but God's, your best, best possibility of success in relationship, whether it's your marriage, your friendship, your work relationships, in all of your relationships, your best possible success rate is going to come as a result of you doing this, loving people. Thank you for joining us at Word of Life Christian Center, where we seek to move upward in prayer and worship, inward in discipleship, and outward in evangelism. We are so excited that you decided to connect with what God is doing here. And if you want to learn more, go to wordoflifelv.com.